Let's uh, revisit these abrupt climate events uh, in the context uh, here again. Uh, this is just zooming into the uh, last uh, 80,000 years or so. Uh, and so that's the last 100,000 year cycle from, let's say, the Eemian to the present deglaciation. So here you are in the glacial period. Uh, and you can see that there are a lot of these uh, kind of hiccups or what you can call abrupt climate changes including the uh, the bowling alarod was the last uh, warm episode before the younger dryas crashed and cooled again and then we came out of it uh, here so these are called millennial oscillations dance guard usher events uh, the colder ones among those are called Heinrich events uh, and so on and there are evidences across the world for these in both hemispheres uh, on land in the ocean in coastal ocean in open ocean and so on and of course in the ice cores but we don't have a very clear uh, explanation for the time scales of these uh, some of which are multi-decadal uh, to centu century long some are a couple of thousand years and there was an argument there was a 1500 year cycle which I think is now rejected and so on so generally let's say even a 40 year abrupt climate change uh, really brings us uh, close to home because a temperature range there is 6 Kelvin to 16 Kelvin of change warming and this is very much uh, the uh, time scale of human uh, lifespan right 40 years is just nothing in terms of uh, decision horizons for most of the uh, infrastructure or energy planning food security and so on nations defense military etc would definitely want to plan for those sorts of time scales and the rate at which we are emitting and warming that's not very far at all 40 years uh, hence but the warming of that range would be a disaster okay so this is going to basically give us a sense of the complexities of uh, the various responses uh, involved. Uh, so let's look at the rapid warming event and a rapid cooling event. So here you have temperature jumping up uh, in a very fast time scale and temperature cooling down, obviously different in the warming and cooling phases as we, as we have seen several times. So at least the amplitude is different here, even though both are called rapid in this context. There is a methane signature we expect already, CO2 signature, but you can see the asymmetry here, okay, both in methane and in CO2 because the vegetation responses uh, of longer lived uh, greenhouse gases like methane and N2O are different than uh, dust and the vegetation response. So if you look at the North Atlantic sea surface temperatures, there is uh, a rapid cooling, uh, the rapid warming that's different than uh, here. And the cooling here is also different than here. So there is that hemispheric asymmetry, which is again related to the Atlantic meridional overturning and the polar amplification processes that uh, we talked about. And this is the dust concentration, uh, which is our iron fertilization. So here is the iron concentration. Uh, so iron uh, deposition that depends on where you are looking. So the biogeochemical cycle response, which very much is part of the vegetation response and the ocean uh, biology response create uh, complicated responses and time scales uh, when you have abrupt um, climate change. But that doesn't change the main story that we have to worry about abrupt changes in the system that are obviously present and possible. So we would most uh, definitely be worried about precipitation changes and temperature changes, CO2 feedbacks in terms of CO, uh, carbon cycle feedbacks in terms of CO2, N2O, methane, uh, etc. are important in terms of understanding whether they amplify the response or damp the response and so on. So given that we don't have a very strong uh, explanation for these, one of the strong candidates is of course uh, the meridional overturning circulation, uh, especially in the Atlantic, as 
we have said uh, when the conveyor belt is strong you have you are bringing more heat into the uh, Gin Seas, uh, Greenland, Iceland, Norwegian Seas so you're going to create a warm uh, climate anomaly here which is can make the um, atmosphere warmer and increase evaporation and leave salt behind and create more uh, deep water but at extreme events the day after tomorrow scenario may be possible where Greenland melts off and then you have freshwater cap and then you get to a slow conveyor belt phase which has happened uh, 8250 uh, years ago for example but none of the models say that this is a possibility uh, in the uh, 21st century or uh, out a couple of centuries uh, as far as we can tell during the weak conveyor belt, uh, on the other hand, the southern hemisphere gets uh, warmer because you are exporting less heat and the northern hemisphere gets colder because you have uh, less heat being brought up here. So you can see the hemispheric asymmetry in these millennial times. So the time scale of this is uh, of the order of decades to centuries and a couple of thousand years. So this is one potential candidate in the, the system. So this is just an indication of the vegetation changes associated with the Danskard Ashgar uh, events. So you can see uh, the uh, range of various uh, biomes uh, from boreal uh, forest to temperate conifers, broadleaves, uh, temperate forests down to herbaceous and shrubland. And the main message I would take is if you look at the uh, glacial stages 5 and 6, 6 and 7 and uh, the uh, this is the uh, stage 6 here um, so you can see uh, that th so these are stadials and interstadials which are essentially warm uh, sorry cold and uh, warm periods so you can see cold periods uh, forests extending further north than some of the uh, warm periods Okay, so there is definitely biogeochemical and earth system uh, feedbacks uh, in these abrupt climate responses. Uh, why is it important? Because again, to look for analog to global warming, we need to know what are all the components of the earth system that are able to respond to rapid changes. Okay, so just the fact that they can respond is important and then to understand whether they feed back to the uh, warming and amplify it or damp it that's also critical that's what is uh, the purpose of this whole chapter perturbations and responses and relevance for global warming